Well, hello everyone and welcome back. This is part two of our The Process of Evolution with Dapper Dinosaur. Yep, that's uh, right. That's me. That is he. And the, a link to his channel should be in the description should ye uh, want to go check out his material, which you absolutely should because he produces great content. Thank you, thank you. This is part two of 40, right? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, there's enough material within the field of, of evolutionary biology to make like a 40 part series. Here's our goal. We're going to read every paper that references evolution that has been published since papers started being published. <laughs> I, I have to interrupt. The correct answer is 42. Ah, there you go. This 42. is part two of 42. 40 to go. There we go. Uh, in actuality, we will we'll probably get through the rest of the process itself today. And then next thursday we will cover the evidence that evolution has been occurring in the past and so if you haven't seen the first part go watch that D dapper and i discussed uh predominantly how variations arise within populations via mutations and recombination and we discussed the first part of natural selection really just the the bare bones basics of natural selection how it contributes to the formation of adaptations all right and without Further ado, we'll move on to the, uh, or we will get back to where we left off, which was with coevolution. So, uh, does it need to be full screen or is that fine? It is full screen on the YouTube feed. Okay, fantastic. All right. <clears throat> okay, so coevolution. There we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're still talking in a sense sort of about evolutionary arms races, but instead of these being where organisms are antagonistic against each other, as we mentioned last time, the gazelle and the cheetah, cheetah's trying to eat the gazelle, the gazelle is trying to escape, or the cuckoos and um, the various birds that they parasitize. These are beneficial relationships. These organisms are evolving in tandem, but to each other's benefit. So one has mutations or variations and the, and then this causes um selective changes in the other species which then causes selective changes in the former and so on and so forth so they enter mutually beneficial relationships with each other wherein each provides the other with something uh, flowers have mutualisms with butterflies beetles flies and hummingbirds the flower provides nectar in exchange for the animal transporting its pollen Probably everyone's familiar with those examples. Um, some corals have a symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are a type of, of algae, quote, quote, because um, algae is not a monophyletic term. It's very polyphyletic. Uh, and so you can see those little the little green specks in that, that the soft coral, or what looks like a soft coral. Those are dinoflagellates. So they are... Dinoflagellates are members of the SAR uh, group, or the Chromista. So their ancestors engulfed a red algae after the, the um, origin of, of the chloroplast. So it's like a Matryoshka doll. You have the chloroplast, which is you know probably related to like Prochlorococcus or one of the other cyanobacterium, cyanobacteria, which is itself inside a green algae which is itself inside a or sorry which is in a red algae which is in inside in an idarian a, in a chromist inside an idarian oh, right. yes. okay. um it's like the animal version of lichen you know because lichen is, is a photosynthetic organism inside of a fungus exactly is, right sorry about that there you go okay uh, yeah, lichens are interesting because it was thought that it was just like one algae and one uh, fungus, but it mm -hmm. turns out that it's probably multiple fungi and perhaps multiple algae, and also there's some bacteria in there, which are also contributing to this 
relationship. There's just a whole bunch of stuff all going on. Uh, it's basically in, a party for microbes. It is absolutely a party for microbes. All right, next slide, please. All right, some, some more examples. Uh, so that's a bee orchid. And doesn't he just look so cute? I just love the bee orchid. Adorable. Um, it is adorable. So not only is this giving off, it's... It's not only giving off, um, you know, floral uh, scent, as flowers are wont to do, and it's not just giving off the the sort of normal uh, petal, bright petal colors, because blue uh, blue flowers are usually pollinated by bees. Um, but also, it's even evolved to look like a bee. So it's going all out to get the attention of bees. Um you know, bees would try to to mate with it and accidentally pick up the pollen and then off they go. So and then with the other one, those are it's it's both orchids. I, I just happened to to pick orchids. There was I didn't choose them on purpose. It was just the ones that came to my mind first. But uh, sexually deceptive orchids. So these are both male wasps and the flowers smell like female wasps. But you can see it's not a very it's not a very pretty flower. They, you know, it's, it doesn't have these big bright petals like the bee orchid does. And so probably under other circumstances, the, the wasps wouldn't come to these flowers. But here they are. They're the, the, lucky and they're going to be sorely disappointed. Yep. They, they kind of walk around, you know, check it out. And they're like, hey, there are no women here. Off we go, I guess. <laughs> and then they fly away. And for the flower, hopefully land on a different flower that also catfishes them. Exactly. Yep. Getting flower fished, flower wasped. I don't... You know, wasp when you're flowering. a wasp, it happens. It's just one of those things. It's just one of those things. Yeah. Next slide, please. And continuing onward. So we haven't really. We haven't talked about speciation yet. We'll get there in a little bit. But this was actually a paper I got to see um, discussed in person when I was at LSU. The the one of the authors, I don't remember which one it was. It was Sattler or Karstens. But this person came to LSU and gave uh, the lecture on this paper. And I it has stuck with me ever since. That was, what, five years ago? It was just such a fascinating paper. So in essence, what happened is... This this pitcher plant, which is Saracenia Saraceniae, um, dispersed west across the Mississippi River because it's a rather old river. It's been around for like what is it, eighteen million years, something like that. It's been a, it's a pretty long time. Um, but uh, there are flies and moths and other arthropods associated with these pitcher plants, and what the researchers found was the the pitcher plants. On the west, on, on the west side, um, we're in a novel environment, and so they speciated. And as they were in the process of speciating, the arthropods associated with them also speciated. Nice. So, because these pitcher plants are the home for these various arthropods. So, I, I just thought that was an absolutely fascinating paper. It's really fascinating, and it it makes sense. You know, once you establish this coevolution as one group involved in the um, coevolution starts to speciate, the other side of that, you know, symbiotic relationship is going to have to adapt to the new uh, situation. And so they're going to probably end up speciating too. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's absolutely. really cool. And then when you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, I don't, it, it kind of has to be that way, huh? Yeah, I, it, it makes sense. It's just, you know, something I find to be really neat. So, all right, next slide, please. All right. Jackson's so, favorite arthropod. <laughs> I mean, it basically is now. Well, I mean, there's also Phineas Vindex, but we won't talk about that guy here. Um, with or up to this point, we have talked about natural selection. We talked about adaptations, sort of in the sense of one off adaptations. And then we carried that a bit further with our evolutionary arms races idea. You, either, you have these these antagonistic arms races where uh, two species are 
trying to uh, outcompete each other or one's trying to eat the other or something like that, or uh, where two species are evolving uh, beneficially in tandem uh, for, for each other's um, benefit. And so the question that logically in, in my mind arises is how far can this process go? And that's where you come to the idea of complexity gradients. Because for most features among organisms, there is a gradient of these features. It's not simply they're there and then they're not there, or vice versa. And so one thing you have to understand about these complexity gradients, and something, you know, the, the famous I quote uh, that creationists love to to throw out from origin of species the very literally the very next sentence says but if every uh generation every variation within each generation is heritable and is beneficial to its host then those structures will just keep evolving there's no reason for that evolution to stop and so uh, as in, we already talked about one example of that we talked about the example of the sharp nosed puffer fish uh, if you guys will remember, if you don't, go watch the last video where these researchers showed that looking progressively more like a puffer fish, like a sharp nosed puffer fish, Canthogaster valentini, confers slightly more protection from predators like wrasses and groupers. And that's that's exactly the point. Every stage, every step has to be adaptively beneficial. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a misunderstanding. And there's kind of a misunderstanding about this um, in some circles that structures are non-functional or they're deleterious until they become functional. And that's just not how evolution works. Yeah. I've often heard people say things like, well, how do you evolve like a nervous system until when there's no like cardiovascular system to connect up to it? And then right. Now that you get a cardiovascular system connected up, you still don't have a digestive tract. It's like, no, 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 no. None of that. That's not how any of this works. Right. These are all things that are co-evolving. And when you start out very, very simple, you don't need a whole lot of this extra stuff. Like, you don't need a complex cardiovascular system. You just kind of need to be small and flat. And then you right. work up there. And it's the same thing with things like uh, the evolution of flight. You know, you'll hear what good is half a wing. Well, well actually, uh, it's uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, and that's uh, foreshadowing. Uh, 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 Yes, it is foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, <laughs> no way. So here's another paper that it is. This is one of my favorite papers of all time. Uh, Santos et al. 2017. Um, so this is Ragavalia. Ragavalia is a member of the water strider family Velid Velidae. And... Uh, this this guy has these little fans on his arms. You can see them down there by his uh, third uh, pair of legs. And those fans arose from a gene duplication. Researchers have you know, sequenced his genes. They know exactly which gene was duplicated, which resulted in those fans. The, the original gene was called Mother of Geisha. And when it was duplicated, the duplicate copy was called Geisha. Guess or, which one was named first? Which one was named first? I mean, Geisha, obviously. Yeah, it was it was Geisha. Um, and so the researchers, you know, figure this out, and it's the 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 functioning of Geisha uh, is pretty closely tied to the development of the fans. And so the researchers thought, okay, or you know, wondered, well, what good is half of a of a fan? Does that provide any sort of movement boost at all? And it turns out. Yeah, it does. When you knock out, or at least partially knock out, uh, these fans, uh, Ragavalia still has a movement boost over its close, uh, uh, I think it's like the sister genus, uh, Stradulavalia. So Stradulavalia can't go upstream because it doesn't have these fans, but Ragavalia can. The fans are adaptively beneficial at all stages. You can have just half a fan, and you still move faster and can move upstream than Stradulavalia. Yep. And moving upstream, I mean, for one of these, is it's, it's a pretty big advantage because the thing is, these guys are, you know, they're water striders, basically. So they're most, 
able to survive hanging out on the surface of the water and jumping around there. Mm -hmm. But if you have to come on land, if you need to go upstream, that poses a pretty severe risk to you. Whereas if you can go upstream, just staying on the water, that's a pretty big advantage. It allows you to also colonize things much farther upstream than you otherwise would have. So, you know, mm -hmm. if a Straduavalia population is relatively far downstream, there might be a great environment for them just, you know, like a, a few kilometers upstream. Well, <laughs> tough luck. Right. Absolutely. So this, that, and that's why this is one of my favorite uh, papers. I just love papers that, that, you know, partially knock out something or show how this thing evolved step by step because there are lots of people who make arguments that, oh, such and such structure can't evolve in a step-by-step -step manner. Well, here are examples of things that can. So, all right, next slide, please. Whoa, how did Dapper know? That's what we That's were going to talk about. amazing. You know, I'll just let you, uh, I'll, I'll just let you handle this one since you are the, the resident theropod. All right, well, first I want to talk about half a wing which and then we're going to get into uh, more feather stuff right so you always hear what good is half a wing well the fact is that it's not just flying that can help animals we know that because we have a lot of gliding animals today like the kalugo or flying lemur um the sugar glider the flying squirrel um there's also even some frogs that manage to glide pretty well there's a snake that managed to fly pretty well. Well, glide pretty well. Nightmare fuel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there are the Draco lizards who fold out their ribs laterally into horrifying rib wings, and they glide pretty well. Um, so gliding is a really advantageous thing, and here's the reason. It's because if you can get a good glide slope, then you can turn a fall into an actual event where you purposefully go from one place to another, whether it be to get to new food, to get access to new mates, or to escape danger, which are all reasons that animals might want to control their fall. And any animal can control its fall to some extent by using things like tail and arm and leg positions to you know, either uh, increase the slope of the uh, glide or to aim exactly for a landing place or whatever. You can just see this with cats, right? How come cats always fall on their feet? Well, because to some extent they can control their fall. And so if you get anything that helps you with this, whether it be a little flap of skin across the fingers or between the wrists and the ankles or uh, from the wrists to the shoulder or anything like that, that can help increase how much lift you get. And from there, if you can start adding energy by means of, say, flapping, and you can slide, extend the glide slope even farther. And once you can do that to the point where and this is on a gradient, right? You go from being able to add essentially no energy after your initial leap into a little bit of energy from some weak flapping. And then eventually, if you can actually add energy at a pace equal to or greater than the pace at which you're losing energy as you fall, then you're now flying instead of gliding, because that's basically what the difference is between flight and gliding. And so we have a lot of animals that are at different stages of this that we can see, right? We have, like I said, like Kalugos who have extensive webbing that's almost bat-like, which is one of the reasons why bats were once thought to be primates, because Kalugos were at the time were thought to be true primates too, and they thought, was thought there was actually a morphological link there because they have very similar uh, you know, gliding and flight systems, as well as some other details of the skull, but that's not what we're here to talk about. But then we also get, well, what about birds? And we actually have a lot of animals with half a wing, basically. So we have things like, um, uh, is that Sinosauropteryx in the middle? Uh, Sinornithosaurus, yeah. Sinornithosaurus. You know what? There's too many dinosaurs who just start with the, the word for China at the front of their name. Like, come on, guys. Yeah. We get it. They're from China. Um, <laughs> so this is an animal that basically has a half a wing. So you can see that if you are familiar with how a bird wing anatomy looks, this is a very similar setup. So you have the thumb up there at the top, and you have the two fingers that are very in very close association. This animal was actually extensively feathered. And then we go up to say like Microraptor up top or um, uh, Archaeopteryx down bottom where you actually have full flight feathers there, but their sternum isn't keeled. So they weren't flapping very hard. And so they also have sort of half a wing, although it's probably likely that at least Archaeopteryx could probably do power flight. Microraptor probably less so. Um, and also this also gets into something called exaptation. So if you look at the left, you have this gradient of feather evolution. We actually have examples of all of these steps in feather evolution in organisms that are either in the fossil record 
or extant. So, you know, at the very end, we have uh, several types of feathers now, like phyllo plumes down and contour feathers and primaries, secondaries, remages, stuff like that. There's a lot of different kinds of feather. And so, <clears throat> oh, and actually says I know Ornithosaurus. I should have just read it. It's all right. But anyway, so the first feathers were probably just there for the same reason hair is basically, or for the same reason hair really evolved, which is just thermal regulation. It's good to stay warm. Now, we always think of the Mesozoic as being a very hot uh, time, and it was a lot warmer than it is today, uh, although we're working on that, apparently. Um, but it still got cold, right? And even if it didn't get cold, it usually was still too cool to just incubate eggs out in the open all the time, because eggs need to be kept very warm. And so having feathers helps with it. And then even, you know, thick veined feathers that are stiff also have probably some thermal regulation role, at least in brooding, because we have ornithomimosaurs who were not flying at all. We know that for sure. They definitely couldn't fly. But they were brooding their eggs the same way that modern birds do, which is to say they were sitting in the nest and covering them with the primaries and secondaries of their wings to help keep all that heat in. And that we actually have them preserved in the brooding posture in fossils. And we know they had to have uh, feathers because not only do they have quill knobs, which is where the feather actually attaches down all the way to a bone for a very you know strong feather attachment, but also that position doesn't actually cover the eggs with anything unless there's feathers attached. And so you go from that, having these feathers for thermal regulation and eventually for brooding and for display, which necessitates these kind of strong, stiff, well-veined feathers. But then they're all pretty useful for extending glide slope because any long, flat thing can provide extra lift. And there you go. That's You're now off to the races to get powered flight. Yeah. Excellent so summary. Thank you. All right. Uh, next slide, please. This is also one uh, that Dapper is familiar with. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, We've definitely collaborated on many of these things. We have. Uh, and that quote, this is the quote I was referring to um, by Darwin. This is the one that immediately follows the, um, uh, what does he say? Like, um, the, to think that an eye, you know, with, you know, which is so perfect and can correct, you know, chromatic aberrations and all this, to think it could have evolved by natural selection seems, you know, ridiculous. But <laughs> uh, yet reason tells me that if numerous grad gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to its possessor can be shown to exist. If further, the eye does vary ever so slightly and the variations be inherited, which is certainly the case. And if any variation or modification in the organ be ever useful to an animal under changing conditions of life, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection though insuperable by our, by our imagination, can hardly be considered real. So, if we can find that gradations exist, and we can, and you'll see that in a moment, and if variations on the eye happen and can be inherited, and they do, they are, and some of these are useful, and again, that's relatively easy to show, then the eye can evolve. Basically, without all the semicolons and commas. Um, another example is the seahorses. Uh, seahorses are um, very highly derived in their behavior and morphology, but most people don't know about all the pipefish that also exist. And pipefish fill in pretty much the whole morphological series from the more fishy, um, or, you know, more regular looking like a fish, uh, synathids, which are the seahorses and pipefish. And then you have like Solanostomus, which is that guy uh, on the bottom. Uh, it's where it says closest relative of Synathids. That's the, the ghost pipefish. And then you have your other pipefish. Um, you, know, uh, you have your pipefish without a brood pouch. Then you have pipefish with partial brood pouches. And then pipefish with full brood pouches. And actually all of these still exist. You can find the whole series still out there. Because the radiation of seahorses occurred relatively recently in geologic terms. But Jackson, so, if seahorses evolved from pipefish, then how come they're still pipefish? Got me. There Forced you go. into early retirement. Evolution <laughs> destroyed. Evolution zero. <laughs> so, uh, so this is just another example of the whole gradient existing. All right, next slide, please. Oh boy, I get to talk about plants. 
Woo! Everybody loves plants. Uh, so, if you think about your life cycle as a spectrum, when you are haploid, which means having only half of your genetic material, and when you are diploid, having the full complement, there are two extremes. One extreme is called being gametic or diplontic, and the other extreme is called being zygotic or haplontic, and I'll, of course, explain what those mean. So, animals and a few different types of algae, uh, I think that's a, a brown algae up there in that picture, um, are what are called gametic. That means you are only haploid while you're a gamete, while you're a lonely little sex cell. That is the only time in our lives when we're haploid. The entire rest of our lives from, zy from uh, zygote onwards, we are diploid, you know, except for the gametes that we produce, of course. And so pretty much the entirety of our life is spent in diploid mode. The opposite of that is zygotic. Zygotic means you are haploid. You only possess half a complement of chromosomes for pretty much your entire life cycle, with the sole exception of when you're a zygote, hence why it's called zygotic. You are only diploid when you're a zygote. And then as soon as you're a zygote, you do meiosis, and then you become haploid again. Now, those are two extreme ends of the life cycle spectrum, but there are organisms that span that whole middle region, which is called having a sporic life cycle, where you are haploid for part of your life cycle, and then you are diploid for part of your life cycle. Like and, a fern. Well, like all plants, really. Um, well, yeah. Plants as a whole pretty much sit along the the, the sporic um, uh, spectrum from the mosses, the the your hornwort, your liverwort, your mosses on the one end where you're much closer to a zygotic life cycle. And uh, that's so you're you're uh, predominantly haploid or you are uh, gametophyte dominant if you want to be technical about it. And then from Fancy. right and then from fern on to gymnosperms, which are the cone bearing plants and the angiosperms, the flower bearing plants, you are sporophyte dominant which means you are diploid for the majority of your life cycle. And so plants kind of sit along this whole little spectrum. We even have fossils of, of plants like a Cooksonia, which seem to have been about half and half. They're like right in the middle, you know, crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And so essentially the entire spectrum exists. Oh, I forgot to say uh, predominantly protists are the ones that are zygotic because it's it's live fast, die young, essentially. Um, you're born, you have sex, you die. That's your whole life. Uh, so you don't need to produce any really complex structures or anything. You're just out there to, to get laid and then die. Um, whereas as you get increasingly complex with the plants... Uh, you become more and more and more diploid. And I think there are some orchids, actually, which are so so close to gametic that they're practically gametic. Like, they're just on the... They're very close to our end of the spectrum in terms of, of the life cycle. But what about hymenopterans? They're still gametic. Oh, well, okay, I see what you're saying. Oh, are um, they? Because their males are haploid. They're still... Yes, they're still considered gametic though um just because they have you have a little um what is it haplodiploidy which is a, a an apomorphy within hymenoptera uh well, not even all hymenopterans i think it's only in some of the hymenopterans right it's a bunch of them so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll just go with it it's most of them right it's most hymenopterans probably um but this is just an apomorphy within this clade because basically what happens is the males are haploid where the females are diploid. Um, and that's weird. And there were lots of hypotheses Very. back in like the 70s about maybe this is why there's so much eusociality among hymenopterans, but that probably isn't the case. Um, but regardless. Uh, so the point is simply here that you have these life cycles and they span the whole spectrum from your 
your more protist life cycle on the one hand, where you're only diploid for a little bit, to our sorts of life cycles where we're diploid pretty much uh, in, in our entirety. And then, of course, on the other side, I had to had to include the eye um, because this is one for which there's lots and lots and lots and lots of data. Um, the the you can go all the way from like simple proteins uh, like rhodopsins, which change conformation uh, based on how much light is in the environment and like bacteria will do stuff like that. Uh, and of course, uh, we have rhodopsins, which um, kick off, uh, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, I'm trying to think of the term of uh, like phosphorylation pathways, basically. Um, you know, the, this protein will change its, its, uh, conformation. And then that will cause an enzyme to uh, move a phosphate group to another enzyme, which will cause it to move a phosphate group to another enzyme and so on and so on. And then that will get propagated as an electrical signal to your brain, right? That's very crudely how it happens. <laughs> um, but not just for us. It happens for, you know, pretty much all animals uh, at different levels of complexity. Like you have sea stars and uh, clams, which have just this little sort of cup. It's just like a little region with some photo uh, receptive cells, right? And they can only tell, is it light or is it dark? That's basically it. And then you can, uh, if you're you know, going towards the, the camera hey, eye, for instance. Light or dark is all you yes. need to set up a circadian rhythm. So if That's you have good reason true. to have different activities at day during the day or the night, well, then great. In fact, that's still how plants are basically working, right? Like they do things like yes. they have these little pores on their leaves that open and close depending on the time of the day. Mm -hmm. They tend to be open at night to bring in to bring in carbon dioxide so they can use it to grow. But also, um, when they're open, they tend to increase their water loss, which is why they open at night mm -hmm. when they're less likely to have water evaporate. And then as the day comes in, they'll close. And the same thing can be true for animals, right? Like maybe you're a coral mm -hmm. and you don't have a real eye, but your, the things you tend to, you know, suspension feed out of the water are more abundant or they're moving around more during the day. So you become a little bit more active during the day. So even that tiny little just basic photoreception, is it light or dark? Even that has adaptive uh, function for many organisms that can't really see, quote unquote, even today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, being able to see like in any way is better than not seeing at all, right? Yeah. Uh, being able to to perceive your environment in some ways better than not being able to just, you know, stumbling around in the dark. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, if you just continue to, to um, sort of invaginate the tissue and, and cup the eye or you know, get closer and closer to sort of enclosing it, that increases your, your acuity, your vision acuity. And so this is like what, nautiluses have and so it's you know light hits at particular regions inside the eye and this helps them you know figure out the direction of light so now we're talking not just is it light or is it dark it's you know we can see fuzzy objects basically yep this is this is a pinhole type eye and you mm -hmm. can actually um there's a thing that sometimes people do during solar eclipses, which is similar, which is you get a little piece of cardboard, right? And you puncture a tiny little hole through it. And then you can watch the eclipse safely through the hole because the hole is getting all that light from the sun because it's so tiny, it can actually differentiate the direction of the sun much better than a wider aperture could. And so you can actually see the shape mm -hmm. of the sun, well, the you know the apparent shape of the sun changing. And that's essentially what's happening. You're using this pinhole, which one reduces the brightness of the light that's incoming because not much of it can get through, which is a problem for organisms, but it's a feature of the pinhole uh, solar eclipse observer because you know you don't want to be blinded by the actual sun. Um, mm -hmm. And two, it sharpens the image. And then um, mm -hmm. the next step is one of the ways that you can deal with the fact that you're re greatly reducing the amount of light that you can take in. And that's the, our yeah. next stage. Yep. If you uh... If you put a lens over over your uh, your little pinhole, then that can help you further focus the uh, the incoming light. 
And now you have very high resolution vision as opposed to the low resolution of like Nautiluses. And we have this type of vision and also uh, I say coleoids, which are uh, octopus and squid. They also have that type of eye. So they have really good vision, just like we do. Um, the other uh, little, the other side of that fork there, those are compound eyes. So uh, compound eyes are pretty neat because it's basically a whole lot of repeats of like one type of cell. It's not like our eyes where you have like all the photoreceptors at the back and uh, you, know, you have the lens at the front. Instead with these, it's you pack lots and lots and lots of this one cell type. And mm -hmm. that's how they perceive light. So anything you want to add? Um, compound eyes are cool and they're underrated. And um, also yeah. trilobites use calcite as a lens, which is weird because it actually only directs light in one direction, which is, you know, it, unlike most other lens types, which actually gather light from a range of angles. And so that's really weird. If you ever get a chance to like take some calcite, um, and like, like some nice optically clear calcite. It's a very strange thing because like, you, it's you can read right through it. Like if you put it right on a book, but then if you lift it up or put it at a different angle, can't see anything. It's very strange. <laughs> and trilobites use it for eye lenses, which is just bizarre. I think, I think uh, that had. I can't remember quite um, what that type of eye was called. If anybody remembers, put it into the the chat because there was a there was a type of name for that eye. I cannot remember. But it was probably something oh, well. that isn't if, just trilobite eye. Yeah, I, man, I'm drawing a blank. Anyways, if someone then, knows what we're talking about, put it in the side chat. Yeah, of course, not all trilobites had eyes. That's true. Yeah, some of them were, were deep sea trilobites and they just didn't have eyes at all. So, yeah, there's no light. What do you need an eye for? Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, next slide, pools. Okay, at this point, we have been talking about how far natural selection can go, and we've really sort of talked about this um, abstractly, I guess. I mean, we've, we've, we've provided examples, but now we're going to talk about how this applies in actual space over a particular geography. And for the first example, this is a another orchid. Oh, my goodness, what was I doing? Just having a fit over orchids i guess i mean they are uh, really cool and they show a lot of different adaptations to a lot of different things so i get it they do they they are pretty cool not gonna lie and they're very pretty i yes. do like orchids and there's one species where you can make a tea that changes color based on ph which is neat because nice. then you can serve someone some tea and then ask if they want some lemon and then put the lemon in there and it changes the color of the tea <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool i like that yeah uh this guy is this the orchid, the flower, not the not the moth, is Satyrian halakii, and as you can see, it is native to South Africa. Then that's a that's a mountain range. It is running along there uh, along the coast. But they kicked it out of Lesotho. Yeah, they said not in not in our country. No, <laughs> only Lesotho source. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and the the cool thing about this flower is the depth of the flowers changes depending on what the pollinator is. So we're applying that evolutionary arms race concept across bio, across the geographic landscape. In the southern area of South Africa, you have short-tongued bees. And as a result, the flowers that they're able to pollinate have, have to have uh, shallower flowers for them to be able to reach. Whereas in the north, the flowers are very deep because they are pollinated by uh, by uh, hawk moths, and so so you have these different selective pressures on these flowers across a geographic range, and it produces a range of phenotypes. So they're all uh, within the same species, quote quote, but they have different morphologies depending on their pollinator. Species are fake, guys. Species are fake. I said that in botany today. <laughs> nice. Um, Did your class riot? <laughs> no, they they just kind of rolled their eyes and said, "Okay, can we go home now?" No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
That sounds about right. <laughs> uh, all righty. Next slide, please. Oh, I, I forgot to add. Uh, biogeography is probably my favorite field uh, of evolutionary biology, simply because it's it, there. There is no model of biodiversity outside of evolution that accounts for biogeography and is parsimonious, or in most cases, to... even attempts to try. Right. Yeah. Because let's let's be real. Um, the people who are not into evolution do not attempt to account for biogeographic distributions. They just say, meh, the organisms went there. Well, That's I have about heard it. that maybe kangaroos wrote a volcano blast to Australia. Yeah, that, that sounds plausible. I would believe that. Which definitely results in perfectly healthy living kangaroos after being <laughs> launched into space and then falling back to Earth. And definitely doesn't result in kangaroo salsa. And apparently, for some reason, marsupials are just super, super effective at rate riding volcano shockwaves through suborbital space flights. It's kind of very, amazing very that, like, that marsupials can survive like volcanoes, but not mice. Like, that's kind hmm. of interesting. <laughs> or cats, for that matter. Or cats, or dogs, or pigs, or foxes. Yeah, it's like, huh. Yeah, those things just destroy them. But volcano <laughs> immune. They're, they're, they're basically like from the fire, the plane of fire. Indeed, they have some really high fire resistance. So, pro tip, you can't right. cook uh, <laughs> kangaroos. That's just impossible. Okay, sorry. Yep, but so yeah, very very high fire resistance, but very low beast resistance, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they they take double damage from piercing attacks. <laughs> oh god, uh, biogeography. I can um, anything. Uh, that's you absolutely can. Yeah, this is true. So the this is basically the the example of biogeography, which kind of kicked off the whole field, and that's. The, the Galapagos, uh, which are a an archipelago, or which is an archipelago, uh, near Ecuador. And Darwin, well, of course. Near. Uh, Near-ish. It's, yeah. it's the closest, the closest thing, uh, the closest mainland thing to the Galapagos is Ecuador. I'll, I'll say that. Um, which, you know, isn't by any means close. You probably wouldn't be no. able to swim it. <laughs> but you definitely wouldn't. I mean, it's it's also yeah. not that much like closer than like Belize or or uh, uh, you know Panama, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a substantial distance. Yeah, it's really remote. um. So, so Darwin uh, circumnavigated the globe from eighteen thirty one to thirty six. It basically started like in December of thirty one, and he it was on the HMS Beagle, which was captained by Robert Fitzroy. And there was a whole crew, and they went first to. Well, I think they made a stop in like one of those little islands in the Atlantic. But then after that, they went to South America. I can't, I can't remember the names of those islands. Um, so they went to South America, and Darwin found lots of fossils of of uh, Pleistocene or Pleistocene uh, mammals like Glyptodon and Megatherium and uh, Cuvieronius none of which had these names at that time, except I think Megatherium uh, and like Macrokenia and also fun, fun side tangent on Macrokenia before I get back to the Galapagos. Um, there was a guy named uh, Emma Gino, I believe was his name, who found a whole bunch of noto ungulates, which we'll talk about in a moment. Actually, no, I'll just save the story for then since we do bring these back up. Sorry. I mean, yeah, if we're going to okay. bring up a noto ungulate, um, yeah, noto -ungulate I just, we should bring them later. I, I just remembered that that I have a slide on that. Um, so the Galapagos. So of course Darwin, you know, Darwin and crew uh, go around the tip of the Galapagos, which is very the tip of South America, which is very cold because you're right next to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So it's not no, called Tierra del Fuego because it's hot. It's called Tierra del Fuego because you have to keep a fire burning all the time, or you're going to freeze to death. Right. Yeah. There, there are actually penguins down there, believe it or not. So then they go back I up the other it. side. And there are actually penguins in the Galapagos too. They're the only uh, equatorial penguins. So um, I would rather be a Galapagos penguin than an Antarctica penguin. 
<laughs> I probably would too. But then again, um, I purposefully moved to the hottest place outside of Death Valley that I could. So, you know. I, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so the Galapagos, there are several islands which have, uh, <laughs> which had, or, you know, they're typically referred to by their Spanish names, but of course this was the 1800s and Darwin referred to them by their English names. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, he was an Englishman. It, exactly, right, yeah. Um, though he spoke Spanish and French and like a little bit German. Um, but but yeah, he referred, like the big island uh, was Albemarle, whereas it, to the, was it the Portuguese, I think, um, it's Isabela. So... Um, and of course, Darwin is famous for the finches that aren't finches that he recorded on the islands. They're actually tanagers, which are related to finches. They're, they're both passerine birds, but tanagers are in a different family. It's uh, Thropidae rather than Fringillidae, which are the finches. Okay, but passerine covers like a huge swath of birds. I'm that's, pretty sure that's the majority is... of bird species. I mean, that's that's probably true. So, um, By the way, it's passerine so, birds are those songbirds, guys. Yes, yeah, the song uh, perching birds, right? Uh -huh. um, so, if, if you see a bird and it's not like a parrot or a raptor or an ostrich or a duck or a, or a chicken, <laughs> like, it's yeah. probably a passerine bird. Yeah. Which is, like I said, most birds. Right, yeah, just, just the vast majority of birds. Um and so on, and so Darwin correctly reasoned, and highly recommend if you haven't read it, read the Voyage of the Beagle. That's his his notebook that he took then with him. Then read the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Very different. <laughs> Just read Narnia in general. It's it's a good series. It is also yeah. Um, Although I really never got into the a horse and his boy. It was always weird to me. Anyway, sorry. They were they were all weird to varying extents. Well, but yes, yeah, we're getting that's off topic. true. Uh, anyway, so Darwin correctly reasoned, and and he was sort of having these ideas kind of bubbling in his brain as he was on the Galapagos. He thought, "Huh, maybe all these these finches, quote quote, that I'm seeing here, which have different niches. Some of them eat seeds, and you know, some eat nuts, some eat insects, some eat cacti, some." actually drink the blood of the blue foot or sorry of the the nazca boobies and actually i think the blue foot boobies are there too um the, the, these guys fill a lot of niches he thought what if they all came from one ancestor or one ancestral population who colonized the islands and thanks to genetic testing we know now that that is absolutely the case all the finches of the galapagos like uh geospiza and sarthidia and podiespiza they're all members of the subfamily Geospezinae, which then, of course, nests within uh, Thropidae. But they're all more closely related to each other on the Galapagos than they are to any of the birds, any of the, the tanagers of South America. But, surprise, surprise to no one, uh, the closest relatives of the Galapagos tanagers are in Ecuador, like Tiaras, the dull-colored grass quit, which is that bird on the top left. And then one of the Galapagos tanagers is on the top right. But not only that, there are also uh, tortoises on the Galapagos Islands, which vary from island to island based on the flora. So some have this, this uh, saddle-shaped shell. And in fact, Darwin and other crew members attempted to ride the tortoises, but were unsuccessful. Um, and I what they found like was the that in areas very, with tall vegetation, there were these saddle... <laughs> I feel like you're right. Uh, in areas with with tall vegetation, the there these saddle uh, shaped morphs lived, but in areas with low vegetation, they had the more sort of normal uh, shaped shell, like that little Chaco tortoise uh, on the the left, who's adorable. And so that yeah, he is pretty cute. And of course, also native to Ecuador. So these all these guys who are in the Galapagos, it's not just the tanagers and the tortoises, but also the the iguanas and the different species of booby. Uh, they all got there by a different, and of course all the plants, all got there by a different um, uh, you know, events, whether they were blown there from storms or rafted or what have you. And they ended up there and 
uh, fill different niches now. And the Galapagos has only been around, I think, for about five million years, something like that. So not very long. It's, this is these are all relatively recent evolutionary radiations. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, just that you know, we can see the same kind of thing all over the place. Um, so you get things like it doesn't just explain why, say island species tend to be cl most closely related to nearby mainland species. It also explains things like, why is it that we have completely different groups of animals filling the same niches, say, like I mentioned before, in Australia versus um, other places like Africa? And then again, uh, say in South America, right? So South America has very similar, mm -hmm. uh, many sem similar biomes to places in Africa and in Australia. But in those places, you tend to get different groups filling the same niches, um, especially with Australia. And especially mm -hmm. if you go like say um, before European contact with Australia. So, you know, you get things like thylacines or even pre-human contact, you get things like uh, thylacoleo or megalania, which was, you know, a, a marsupial, first one, but thylacoleo is sometimes called the um, marsupial lion because it was not quite as big as a lion, but it was pretty big. And megalania is basically, you know, a gigantic lizard, probably the biggest non-aquatic lizard to ever ever live. And um, <clears throat> and then instead of deer, you get kangaroos and all these animals. And it's like, well, well, why? And the answer is because Australia, having been isolated for so long, it evolved its own set of animals to fill these niches, which still existed. And in that area, that's where there were a lot of marsupials. Whereas in many other parts of the world, which were still connected or close enough together that rafting between them was very easy, you got a lot of placentals. But interestingly enough, in the fossil record of South America, you also get a lot of marsupials, as well as mm -hmm. Antarctica. Why? Because when the marsupials were undergoing their first radiation, South America, Antarctica, and Australia were all connected. And then you see through the geological record, as placental animals come in, it's when North and South America are getting close together or even connecting. And very few marsupials managed to survive to today from South America, except for those darn possums and relatives, which is why you have the opossum, the one and only native North American mammal. It came from South America. That's why its relatives are still in South America. Yeah, absolutely. Including a semi-aquatic species, which is fun. <laughs> yep. All right. Next, please. So this is a picture most of you have probably seen. Um, this was uh, this is sort of a stylized version of a chart that Alfred Wegener uh, came up with back in the early 1900s. He realized that the best way to explain the distribution of certain uh, these are all I think Permian fossil organisms or sorry early Triassic. Uh, Triassic, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can see why you would think Permian because you know there's a Lystrosaurus in there and that's one of those synapsids that stretches across the Permian into the Triassic. Right, yeah. So, uh, like early Triassic fossils, you have Glossopterus, which is a type of fern, Lystrosaurus, uh, I think that's a Mesosaur down there, and then Synagnathus, which is a also a synapsid. That one, Synagnathus is closer to us than Lystrosaurus is. Yes, um, considerably. But, and so, he figured that, uh, correctly, uh, that the only thing which could account for this distribution is if these continents were connected. And we know he was right, or we know today he was right, but he didn't have a mechanism to explain how the continents could uh, move. And so his ideas were uh, were not believed for a long time. He didn't have the data really to support it. It wasn't until much later uh, that researchers figured out like what mid-ocean ridges are. I think that was in like the 40s with the, the development of like sonar technology for wartime stuff. So, uh, Thanks, then, World War One. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have World War One. And then and as as different countries are essentially scanning the deep ocean, uh, they start to find these different uh, ge geographic and geologic features. And this data starts kind of piling up and researchers like, huh, it kind of seems like there are different plates, maybe that the yeah. continents are on and some are diverging and some are sliding under each other. And that's and interesting. suddenly things like the ring of fire around the Pacific makes more sense. And why are there geothermal hot springs in some areas like Iceland and Greenland, but not so much in others starts to make sense. And mm -hmm. um, also before that, people basically thought that the bottom of the ocean out, outside the continental shelves was just sort of a smooth plane of like muck. 
Yeah. And it turns out, nope, it's not. I mean, it is in some places, but overall, no. Right. It's mostly like basalt and that sort of stuff in the really deep um, ocean areas, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's, it's got mountains and valleys, mm -hmm. and it's got its own geology going on down there. Yeah. And so this, again, this distribution doesn't really make any sense on a non old earth non evolutionary model there's really no way to account for this but hey guess what uh, I feel accepting... like you're forgetting volcano shockwave surfing oh my bad except for that there's no other way to account for it. <laughs> except for, yeah uh next slide please I, I totally forgot we had a marsupial slide no, in here. No, you to... Dapper, you you absolutely you beat us to the punch on that. You beat. Oh, you beat sorry. Well, no, it's okay. I mean, I'll just I'll just reference it in a moment. Um. So yeah. So um. I I also beat myself to the punch because I forgot I had a noto ungulate thing on here. It's been a while since I opened this this PowerPoint. Um. So, in the early Cenozoic, so the last sixty six million years, um. Some placental mammals made it to South America uh, before South America. To well, I mean, before that, in the Mesozoic, sorry, uh, placental mammals made it to South America. Marsupials were already there. That's where uh, modern marsupials originated. And some of them, as Dapper already said, crossed Antarctica, which was a prediction of evolution that if mm -hmm. there are some, that there, if there are marsupials in South America and also in Australia, then they would either have to be in Africa or in Antarctica. And it appeared based on the geologic data that Africa split off too early. So that left Antarctica. And lo and behold, researchers have found Antarctic marsupials dating to the like the late or the, the Eocene, I believe. So what a surprise. Uh, <laughs> uh, whereas the noto ungulates are a group of placental mammals and I believe uh, protein data has rooted them as near the perissodactyls, so the odd hoof mammals, which is kind of interesting. We have a few bits of like proteins that researchers have managed to get off of fossils and sequence it, and it turns out it's close to uh, that of rhinos, horses, and tapirs. So th those are their closest to living relatives. Which, which makes them true ungulates, which was a debate for quite a while. Right. So there was the debate like, does Noto ungulata uh, convergently evolve the ungulate stance and they're actually outside of crown ungulates? Or are they somewhere within crown ungulates? And if so, where? And it turns out, yeah, they're slightly closer to um, uh, Parasodactyla than they are to Artiodactyla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Noto ungulates, because South America became an island in the, in the Mesozoic. It became an island and it was an island for a pretty long time. But for most of the Cenozoic South America was separate from uh, the other continents. That's why you it get weird things like notoungulates and fossoracids. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You. You. Um. It wasn't until like what three million years ago, something like that, that the Isthmus of Panama formed. Yeah, it was and, very, very recent, like a few million years. Yeah. Yeah, and the North and South America were finally able to exchange flora and fauna. So very recently, and North America kind of dominated that exchange, like. A Possums and armadillos are the only major animals that made it to North America and are, you know, extant to this day. Um, also, uh, raccoons. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah whereas, the ungulates, they didn't do so well. <laughs> yeah, whereas jaguars, bears, elephants, um, all, all sorts of stuff went from North America into South America and just dominated. South America was kind of a disaster for, for uh, them. Cats, yeah, just like yeah. Uh, lots of cats. Because canids, uh, there's a whole bunch of native canids down there, like the short-eared dog, the bush dog, oh, the tapers? main wolf. Yeah, tapers, parasodactyls went down into there. Yeah, it that exchange <laughs> went poorly for South, native South American animals for the most part. Yeah, yeah, lots of lots of extinctions. Yeah, pretty much they wiped out the last of the noto ungulates. Lots of marsupials. But this time extinct. it wasn't humans. Yeah, um, but noto ungulates. As, as, but uh, once again, little... marsupials, Achilles heel, cats and dogs. Right. Not flames, cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the weird thing about noto ungulates is they evolved um, convergently to fill lots and lots of niches that other um, mammals uh, 
fulfilled in different or in other continents. So they were like they were rabbit like noto ungulates, mm-hmm. like pachyrucus, which is weird. They were horse like ungulates. Uh, they were sort of hippo like ungu- or there was, noto ungulates. There was actually a lineage of noto ungulates that was so horse like that they actually evolved a single hoof. Yeah, the, um, the top term morphology. Yeah, yeah, um, and that led uh, Amagino. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and I'm probably not. So you know, it is what it is. I don't, I don't speak Portuguese. Um, it led him to conclude that all the other groups of placental mammals evolved from those those <laughs> South American forms. He was so impressed, and of course, this made him an absolute hero. Uh, you know, in South America, like, oh, well, look yeah. at our paleontologists finding the very first horses and the first, you know, rabbits and everything. So, yeah, it turns out not so much, guys. Sorry. Yep. Yep. That wasn't until uh, later that uh, as these as paleontology progressed um, and research realized, no, these guys aren't uh, they're not closely related at all. Turns out the first horses lived in North America, not South America. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the first rhinos and the basic parasodactyla evolved in North America. Yeah. And then they all died out. <laughs> Until the Spanish brought some of them back. Yay! It would a comeback. I love a good comeback. That's why there are feral horses not far from me. I see them not too infrequently. <laughs> uh, all righty. Uh, next slide, please. And so, yeah, more about geography. Um, this is a this is a very interesting one. Uh, while Darwin was circumnavigate, or he circumnavigated the world, and then uh, came back to England and started his work. Well, first he started work on on uh, geology. He wrote a couple books on geology, and then he wrote his then he did his work on barnacles. And while he's doing all of this, and the ideas that would become evolution are, you know, are, are meshing in his mind and and evolving themselves there's another guy who's also working on very similar ideas in a completely different part of the world that is alfred russell wallace and uh and wallace really doesn't get much of the credit you know we kind of mentioned him he started passing that's true he didn't publish first he uh sent a i think it was a letter to darwin who had become rather popular at that point for all the, the fossils he found in South America and the books he written on geology. And he was becoming quite a, a scientific celebrity. And Wallace is like, hey, I have these ideas. What do you think about this? And Darwin was like, oh, crap, I'm about to be scooped on this idea I've been working on for 20 years. I should probably get it down and publish that book, huh? Yep. And so um, he had, because Darwin did not like to go out and and speak at conferences or anything like that. So he had, I think it was Huxley, read both Wallace's paper and Darwin's sort of preprint, his abstract, on on uh, natural selection. And then immediately thereafter, Darwin got started on origin. Uh, he had plans for a larger book on natural selection, which never got finished apparently. But but origin, origin of species, uh, was the one that that stuck and. Darwin is predominantly credited with natural selection. And so Wallace was working on similar ideas. He was also working in an archipelago or archipelago, however you pronounce that. I don't know. I don't do words. Doesn't even make sense. You know what? Just pronounce it the way you want to. Who cares? (laughs) Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Here's a pro tip. The way that the dictionary gets their pronunciation guides is by listening to people say the word. Mm -hmm. And if everyone says it a new way, the dictionary updates. Fair enough. You got me there. So biogeography in this, or the biogeography of this area, which is called uh, Wallachia or Wallachia, however you want to, I usually say Wallachia, is you have the the Asian fauna on one side of this line, Wallace's line, and then you have the Australian fauna on the other side. Now, why on earth would that be the case? Well, as it happens... Australia was part of Gondwana, the southern supercontinent d- during the Mesozoic, whereas Asia was part of Laurasia, the northern supercontinent. And so these continents were separated for a very long time, and now they're finally coming together, and the fauna is very different in both. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so you have your, your kangaroos and platypuses and you know, wallabies and all that sort of stuff on one side and Komodo dragons on the, the Australian side and then you know, elephants, tigers, monkeys, all those guys on the Asian side. Very different faunas. And then Aphrotheria, which is an order, one of the, the four, uh, sorry, one of the four super orders of placental mammals. And all these guys evolved in Africa. Africa was also an island for quite a while, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And you have elephants and elephant shrews. I just love that elephant shrews are related to elephants. That's great. And not they're not insectivores anymore or in, in members yeah. of insectivora. And they were named elephant shrews before we knew that they were actually related to elephants. Yeah, which is just wonderful. Fantastic. Although I see we also have the precursor of the dolphin. Gross. <laughs> you, dare lie, everybody. you dare besmirch my PowerPoint presentation with David Peters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that this is a little bit of a side tangent, but David Peters owns a couple websites like uh, Pterosaur Heresies and ReptileEvolution.com. Um, yeah. Never mm. use either of them for sources. They are completely bonkers about virtually everything, except, yep. I guess that some animals exist he gets that right <laughs> yes a few a few of them do in fact exist yeah but he, that, he has bonkers. crazy ideas like dolphins are closer to elephants than they are to cows which is not true yeah that they're the descendants of tenrex yeah he actually left that on a on a video i made way back i don't think it was no it wasn't the <laughs> whale penis one it was um the misunderstanding uh whale transitional fossils video yeah oh. he left that comment and i was like this is bonkers sir please post more so by the way when i was at um the the uh, was it the painted desert park with rj and mm -hmm. our friend colton and our friend you know aaron and um you know the whole group of people bent hoven yeah. um <sighs> They made me try to read the paper about, um, uh, what was it? Oh my goodness. It was like something or Desmostylians or something. Hippos or Desmostylians or something like that. Oh yeah. And, and I those couldn't... are the descendants of, of whales. Yeah. Yeah. Or and I couldn't, whales, sorry. I couldn't get through it. I just like, I just <laughs> collapsed. La I literally, I had to sit down. I was laughing too hard because of how stupid everything in S. Peter's quote unquote paper was. It all made no sense. Yeah. No, it's absolutely terrible like um, if you think ken hoven is bad at this that's i mean you should like the ken hoven Peters. of evolution i guess you could basically, say basically it yeah basically this is uh, a guy who was told by a paleontologist like oh hey that thing that you're interpreting as like integument that's a tool mark i made while preparing this fossil myself personally <laughs> and david peters was like you don't know what you're talking about it's like but i made it <laughs> no <laughs> part of the fossil okay sure yeah, just, he's just he's sure. crazy. Don't listen to him. No. Um, other Afrothers include the Aardvark, which is that guy in the middle left. Oh, yeah. And the Hyrax, bottom left. Then Elven True, top I'm right. Getting Tenric. slightly offended. You talk about me and, and and. No, you're Peter, not Peters. Uh, David okay. Peters. My, Peter. my bad. He's multiple yeah. Peters. My bad. Yeah. Uh, and then the Manatee. Um, and I, I, I know him as well. I don't. Uh, All Peters know each other. <laughs> no, no, the manatee. Just one. Oh, okay. Um, but where's the so dugong, the... Jackson? Yep. Sorry. No. Actually, no. I think that is a dugong based on the tail. Yeah, you're right. The, the tail, tail has the looks pointed. like a dolphin tail and not like a round. Yeah. So really, yeah. that it is probably a, a dugong. Um, it's but a very the fat cool dugong. thing, I don't remember if we talked about this on my channel or yours but we mentioned how elephant the earliest elephants and the earliest sirenians look very similar have very similar uh, niches very similar gates um overall just like marotherium and like uh pezosiren mm -hmm. was are like very similar to each other morphologically which makes yeah. sense because they're the sirenia and uh proboscidea are yeah. are uh sister clades yeah. So, yeah, which is and then surprise, surprise, the earliest members look almost identical, which is also the case when you look at like Rhino Ceratidae and Equidae, which is the rhinos and the horses. Mm -hmm. The earliest uh, Rhino Ceratids and the earliest Equids are virtually indistinguishable. It actually takes experts in tooth morphology to distinguish them. Yes, 
Yeah, it's like one has cross crests on its teeth and the other one doesn't. That's basically yeah. it. <laughs> there are people whose job it is to sort through teeth to figure out if they're horse or rhino teeth because it's the only way they can tell which group the, a particular animal belongs to. Yeah, we had uh, Donald Prothrow on this channel a couple times way back and he, that was actually part of his work was um, uh, in Nebraska, there's a big fossil site that is like a, a legacine, I think. And it was there's a, a big volcanic eruption which covered the whole area in ash and yeah, suffocated lots of animals. I can't remember the name. What, was it like White Hills or something like that? Is it Ashfall Beds? Because that's another one, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's the same one. Because the Ashfall oh. Beds, but that might not be in Nebraska. Well, at any rate, uh, look up Donald Prothero. I'm sure you'd find it. Uh, that's homework so for you guys back at home. <laughs> Next slide, please. Did it change? It did. Oh, there it goes. Okay, sorry. I think I don't know if my internet's slow. Um, well, we know your internet is slow. Uh, 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 you're not wrong. I know you're not wrong. At when when nothing changed for a second, I was panicking because I thought my internet had dropped out. Anyway. Um, Actually, so back to the Isthmus of Panama, as we were talking about earlier, okay, 3.5 million years ago, uh, you had this one continuous population of pork fish. We actually have these guys, the aquarium where I work. Nice, and which version? The uh, Virginicus. Okay. Because uh, they're, they're the the common, uh, they're the more common one in the aquaria. So, um, so you had this one continuous population, which, you know, was interbreeding and off the northern coast of South America, and then the Isthmus of Panama formed, and now you have a break, and they both sides cannot interbreed with each other any longer. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you have speciation. They have novel adaptations, because I'm sure as a result of the Isthmus of Panama forming, you had like current changes, and the way that like warm and cold water distributed throughout the oceans would have changed drastically. So, um, so that would have caused novel adaptations in these different uh, fish as a result. And now they're different species. Uh, this is also true of lots of different, I think like mantis shrimp and there's some urchins and stuff. The various marine organisms, which live around on, on both sides of the Isthmus of Panama are typically pretty yeah. closely related to each other. There'll be like sister species. And that again, doesn't make any sense at all. Unless it was a continuous population until the Isthmus of Panama formed. Right. And that requires old earth and evolution. So because if so, if the Isthmus had been there for a very long time and organisms had had to spread for millions of years or even just since their inception with the Isthmus there, you would expect that the closest relatives on either side would actually be north or south on the same right. side. So the closest right. relatives of, you know, the um, eastern pork fish, I'll say, would probably be in like the Gulf of Mexico or on the east coast of South America. But nope, opposite side of the isthmus, which means couldn't have formed that long ago in terms of geology, in terms of, you know, the history of evolution of life on Earth. Right, absolutely. And then uh, just another paper on uh, Laurage there, biogeography. We actually, or I talked about this in a, a bat video because that's, it's really hard to see. But that that chart refers to bats. So the yellow, the yellow ones uh, over there, those are the different other Laurage there groups. But bats also started out in, in uh, so basically all the rage there's started out in North America and then spread from there, including bats. And you can see that the phylogeny of bats is uh, correlated with different continents. So that's pretty cool. That's called phylogeography, where you trace the phylogeny of a group of, or, or some clade um, across an area. It's a really cool field and it is becoming increasingly well studied because we're getting increasing amounts of data. So you get some really neat patterns showing up. You can also do that within a single species, which is one of the ways that we know uh, that uh, slide, humans please. originated Oops. in Africa and not say the Middle East. Yes. <clears throat> absolutely right. Because humans did not originate in the Middle East. They absolutely uh -huh. originated in Africa. And the evidence on that is pretty darn clear. So, yep. Okay, now we've talked about natural selection for an hour and a half. <laughs> so let's talk about sexual selection. We are probably not going to finish this part of the, or we're not going to get as far as I thought it's we okay. would, which is okay. Parts. That means, 
<laughs> that means we'll just be back next week. Okay, sexual selection. Uh, this was also an idea that Darwin um, formalized. I'm not going to say he came up with it per se. I'll say he formalized it because I don't know if it's technically true that he came up with it. But the idea, the basic idea behind sexual selection is we talked about intra-specific um, competition mm -hmm. previously when we first started talking about natural selection, and that's organisms within a, a population, so members of the same species competing for some resource. And in this case, it's mates. So these are uh, what are called sexually dimorphic animals. Uh, and sexual dimorphism refers to the differences uh, between the sexes. So in, in deer, for instance, uh, you have these, these males, obviously, and they have these big antlers. But the females don't have big antlers. Or in the case of elephant seals... They, you know, are huge, and I think that's a female in the foreground. Yes, those you can are, see the males are adult are... females in the foreground. Yeah, those are adult females compared to the adult males. Just look at how much bigger the adult males are. It's bonkers how much bigger they are. Yeah, and the the reason for this, as as Darwin uh, noted, and it's been noted ever since, is organisms that have very high sexual dimorphism. So the males and females are very different tend to be uh, uh, poly, uh, polygamous. They tend to be polygamous. They tend to be one male mates with a bunch of females. Which a harem, is called, if uh, you will. Right. That's also called a polygyny, which is the more uh, precise term. And so so basically the males will battle. This is, called, this is what Darwin called the law of battle. Uh, and in my opinion, it's the, the less interesting of the the types of sexual selection. We'll get to the more interesting one in a moment. But but in essence, the males fight for the females. And whoever the winner is uh, it gets to pass on their genes. The loser does not. So sad. Anything you'd like to add? Well, sometimes the loser then goes and a, decides to be a sneaky male, where they basically hang yes. out at the edges of the harem and opportunistically mate Sometimes, in the case of elephant seals, by bribing females with food. So, it's not like you completely selected against. You got a shot, but it's not very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and, and also, this is the other major force behind why organisms have armaments. It's not all just natural selection, so they're not always just protected from predators. Also, a lot of times, uh, armaments evolve for a male male competition yeah actually with the deer that's a good example because deer only grow antlers um when it's mating season basically this is there are some right. species that have you know year round and even both sexes but most deer only grow antlers during mating season and then shed them because they don't need them outside of mating season they're not using them for defense against wolves and bears they're using them for mm -hmm. bait competition right exactly Okay. All right. Next slide, please. All right. This is, in my opinion, the more interesting type of sexual selection. And this form also has a very interesting history. So female mate choice is kind of the opposite of, of a, it, well, sort of. In, in a sort of way, it's kind of the opposite. Because with the law of battle, the males are you know fighting each other. And they get and to the victor goes the spoils. But in this case, the males have to, they still have to compete with each other but typically non-violently because they don't want to damage their their uh, their goods, basically, so they can advertise to females. They're competing, but in a non-violent way. They want the female to pick them. Whoever has the prettiest feathers, it's in the case of the great Argus pheasant, or whoever can dance the best, that's what lecking is, That these blue mannequins. You can see the female. She's kind of hard to see, but she's like kind of green and gray, whereas those are all males, all those blue guys, and they perform this very acrobatic dance to impress her. And uh, if you really want to know more about the female mate choice, I highly recommend the book, uh, The Evolution of Beauty by Richard Prum. He's an ornithologist. It's a real good book. Um, he also has no time for evolutionary psychology, which I also appreciate. So, uh, but the, the history about it. So Darwin uh, was attuned to female mate choice. He included this in The Descent of Man, 
and Selection in Relation to Sex. That was his other really big book. That was where he formalized sexual selection uh, and also uh, really delivered the, the hammer, the hammering blow on how humans are definitely primates and share common ancestry with other apes. Um, and the, the cool thing about, about that idea was that was kind of progressive for his time. The idea that females are choosing males. Um, and it was, it was so progressive. In fact, that Wallace, uh, he was very opposed to the idea. He was more Darwinian in a sense than Darwin was. He was like, no, everything's natural selection, female mate choice. I mean, you know, law of battle, sure, I'll agree to that. Whatever, fine. Males can fight over females, but the females are not actively choosing their mates. That that just doesn't... Females can't do that. That doesn't sound real. And so... I feel like he'd never been to a club. <laughs> well, it was the mid-1800s, so... Yeah, maybe I don't That's know. probably true, Just yeah. a gentleman's club. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, probably true. No ladies' night at the gentleman's club. <laughs> Women aren't allowed to be out of the house. Oh, well, that's yeah. never been true. <laughs> you couldn't actually have a functioning society where they just weren't I know. ever allowed out. I know. Um, but female mate choice was unfortunately because uh, Darwin died before Wallace did. And Wallace and Huxley kind of became the main spokespeople for evolution. And both of them weren't really on board with mate choice, with female mate choice. So the idea kind of languished until mm -hmm. like the what, 60s or 70s, because interestingly, um, science is often influenced by social events. And as it happens in the 60s was the sexual revolution. And this also triggered a sort of reform in some ways of looking at how organisms do sex. And female mate choice made a comeback in that time period as a result. And now today it's, pretty much it's it's i don't think know, it's disputed really at all it's not disputed yeah it's kind of a non-argument at this point everybody's really on board with it now uh so so yeah so science isn't always about ivory towers and being totally disconnected from the world around you sometimes there is some cultural influence that doesn't mean any of the conclusions are subjective or relative or something like that that just means there is some input it you know in both directions which is a good thing Anything to add on this point? No, I think I, I added as much as I wanted to. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, and here we have a couple examples of some very extreme sexual dimorphism. You have the, the anglerfish, uh, Linofrini arborifera. And so that's the female. Uh, I think it's, what is it? I think it's serratioide is the name of the of the, the clade of anglerfish where the females are really large and the males are basically parasites on the female. I was going to say that male is about as developed as they get. They also, they then get less developed because what they do is they, <laughs> they find a female. They, once they grow to this, to this ridiculously small size, their goal in life is to find a female. Then they bite onto her and then they sort of merge with her and right, like, yeah, essentially. their territory systems combine and then pretty much everything except the testes of the male just kind of just rots away. Not rots away, but it sort of um, doesn't function goes as away. It, yeah. yeah, as much so, as it used to. <laughs> yeah, basically, even the nervous system just kind of goes away eventually. So the mm -hmm. male is now basically just a genetically set, a genetically distinct set of testes that the female can use to fertilize eggs. And any given female can have several males attached. So she, you know, got a whole bunch of extra pairs of balls just hanging out. <laughs> that's yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and it was interesting because for a while, researchers could not figure out where the male anglerfish were. It's like, you know, every anglerfish they pull up is a female. And they're like, how could this be? You know, where are the males? Well, it turns out they were there the whole time. Right. On the female. We're just looking in the wrong spot. Yep. <clears throat> Actually, I have a, a fun thing with the uh, the orb weavers. Um, mm -hmm. I was in uh, South Carolina with some family a few years ago. And shortly before my nephew decided to run towards a very large alligator, um, <laughs> where we had to restrain him to say, no, please do not get eaten by this 
prehistoric monster. Um, we were looking at some orb weavers. And there was a male orb weaver approaching a female orb weaver. And so I made the comment that, see, that's the boy spider. Refused to believe that the male and female spiders could be this different. Like, nope. Mm -mm. He, did, he just didn't believe me. And I was like, all right, well, I mean, you don't have to. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... it was completely you know, went against all of his intuition. Yeah, I mean, they're 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 tiny, you know, uh, and yeah. essentially and what happens is the males... are gigantic. Yeah, they're they're crazy big. That, um, that animal that you're seeing there, the female, it's probably bigger than your hand. Yes. Yeah, that's that's not. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's smaller than life size, believe it or not. <laughs> well, depending uh, on the screen you're watching it on. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Seeing it on mine, it's yeah, smaller than my hand. But uh, anyway, so the male basically what he has to do is he takes his little spermatophore, which is a, a packet of sperm, because arachnids are weird. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically lost the ability; they lost the the swimming sperm, which is why if horseshoe crabs are in fact sister to hooded ticks. It's going to be real weird trying to explain how that reversion came about, which is why I don't think it happened. But I think their phylogeny is probably. Yeah, wrong. I press X to doubt on what it takes being the sister group to uh, Xyphosura. Yeah. So, uh, because hooded ticks, just like all other arachnids, have sperm packets, they have spermatophore. Mm -hmm. So the, the male basically you know, has to sneak up on the female and insert his little spermatophore without getting eaten, at least before he does it. Right. You know, she can eat him as soon as he does it, and he's already accomplished his, his evolutionary goal. So. Uh, but yeah, it's I just imagine like, you know, he's got his friends watching on a branch nearby and they're like, careful, Jeffrey, careful, Jeffrey, careful, Jeffrey. He did it. Oh, she got him. Yeah. But he did it, though. He did it, though. Yeah, you can die yeah. happy. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, and just like natural selection, we can test sexual selection. We can test, in fact, all of the uh, evolutionary mechanisms. Crazy. This is a very famous experiment, which was done back in the 80s uh, by, uh, I think, John Endler was his name. So he took guppies, which were from uh, Trinidad. He took these guppies and made... But not Tobago. <laughs> right, yep. Uh, and he released them into these ponds. And what he found was in ponds where there were no predators, you know, he just had the little killifish, the guppies became progressively brighter. They had these blue, shiny spots on their sides, and those got brighter over the generations. Well, he also made ponds with these guppies, but also added the pike cichlid, Crinocicla alta. And what happened there was the guppies became less and less colorful. So you had sexual selection operating in the in the no predator environment, but natural selection overpowered the sexual selection in the predator pond, which is pretty darn cool. You have this, this evolutionary trade-off because you want to attract mates, but you also don't want to get eight. Yeah, it's always a balance act, right? And that's actually part of the reason that sexual selection works in some species, because it can be a indirect signal of ability to survive, right? So um, male it's peacocks, well, I was going to say male peacocks, but all peacocks are male because the other ones are peahen and the species right. is peafowl. Right. Anyway, people don't know that. So peacocks, like that ridiculous tail is a hindrance. But if you've got, you know, if you're healthy enough and you got good enough genetics to survive despite that weird handicap, well, that's a pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, the technical name for that is the Havy's principle. Um, and there's there's like math to to back it up um, <laughs> math. because because I mean, it's, you know, at the core of it, a lot of evolution or a lot of biology generally is, is like math based. And, you know, we have we've talked about population genetics uh, in, in the last video, which is essentially these these different guys in the 30s came up with the math for how natural selection works, right? What is the rate at which a mutation which has a certain selective advantage spreads through the population given a you know certain amount of selective pressure? How long would that take? And yeah. in the 30s, uh, Ronald Fisher, Sewell Wright, J.B.S. Haldane, and other guys like that, they figured that out. 
And also, that's why there's a unit of measurement called the Darwin. Yeah. Uh, what is it? A ten percent change per million years? Isn't that what it is? So I don't or remember. One percent change per I, million years. I think actually a Darwin is um, a, for, a fixation per generation, and nothing actually gets up to a Darwin. Things are measured in milli-Darwins usually. Okay, maybe that's what it is. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's it's <laughs> the Darwin exists. Um, it's and unit of measurement. Do, yeah, people who do like um, rates of evolution stuff, like um, oh, I always forget his name, George Gaylord Simpson, and like Gould. Uh, people who do that sort of stuff use darwin's but most biologists don't so you probably won't see it used very often but at any rate all right next slide please uh another test of sexual selection so this is sort of along the same lines as the the zahavi principle the the hindrance hypothesis if we want to be alliterative so by the way, one Darwin is defined as an E-fold change in a trait over one million years. Paul Day named the unit after Charles Darwin, which is a 0.2718 roughly change. Because E. Okay. The natural number. Which is Bizarre. a weird unit, but whatever. Yeah, that's a... Seems like a very arbitrary unit, but whatever. Well, look, Ryan. my guess is that somewhere in the math, the natural number came up a whole bunch, and so it became a handy thing to use as a unit. Sure. Because... Sure. It can't because the natural number is a weird. It's one of those weird numbers, sort of like pi. It just shows up places, and you're just like, okay, sure, we'll use it. Right? Isn't that like how in what is it in banking? Like the number seventy two shows up a lot, or something like that. Yeah. Or there's um there's uh Pareto distributions where if you have a random sample of like like it comes up with all sorts of stuff like um eighty percent of money is owned by about twenty percent of people. The same thing hmm. is basically true for like land, like private land ownership tends to be about 80% of land is owned by about 20%. But even then within that, like of the 20% of money that's, or sorry, the 20% of people who are left with that money, of their hmm. money, 80% of it is owned by 20% of them. <laughs> and so like, yeah, there's all Turtles sorts of all places. The way down. Yeah, there's all sorts of places where weird things like that, like normal distributions come up all the time too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just one of those things where like, the natural world, it likes certain things in math, like Pareto distributions, the natural number, uh, normal distributions, the golden ratio, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Right, <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, all that fun mathy stuff. But this isn't a math channel. It's um, a so channel. this is sort of in that same vein where you have uh, a feature. I mean, we've we've done some math for the uh, the ancestors' tale videos. We've done we've been doing a little bit of math in those. That's true. Um, we gotta get the actual selection, regardless. so that way yes. we can get to part three of forty next time. <laughs> oh, three, sorry, three of forty-two. My bad. Right? Yeah, I can't forget it. The other two. I'm um, rounding. So this this frog, Hyla versicolor, the North American gray tree frog, they have. They, you know, give off calls as frogs typically do, except I have Hymenochiris frogs and I have looked at them. I've like watched them and they open their little mouths and they jiggle like they're making noise, but they make no noise unless it's I mean, it's maybe on, on my scale. It's it's just so high pitched. I can't hear it. But the other frogs in the tank can, which I think is probably what's happening. But yeah, there's at any rate, um, these guys. So their their call duration. So the longer they can call, the it it turns out that the the better their uh, their you know uh, genotype is. And so uh, there's this really interesting correlation with these that, that these researchers found. But of course, you can your call can only go you know so long because otherwise you <laughs> run out of air or maybe it's really bad on your your vocal cords to make very you know the the calls required to attract females or what have you so there's a limit to how long your call can be but the males who have who you know are in that upper range tend on average to have a higher genetic quality than other males all righty next pulls and here's another uh, and this is um this is in fact testing pretty much directly the the idea for like the peacocks but these are uh, widow mm. birds so researchers 
uh, cut off the tails, and it's just feathers. It's not their yeah, actual tail, tail feathers, folks, right? Their tail feathers, um, and they attached those feathers to other males. And the females were more attracted to males who had these ridiculously long tail tail feathers than the males who did not. Man, it's got to be a rough time to be in the first group. <laughs> right like like oof, come on man what why did you do, you do like this that? what what why why did i what did i do to you you know <laughs> and so Sorry, this is guys. also in support of that whole um you know the birds uh, of the zahavi principle the birds who can keep a long tail and can also escape predators are you know more likely or, or they have a more fit genotype than males who can't obviously because they get weeded out of the gene pool by predators Mm -hmm. So, um, because there's also something similar done with uh, swordfish because there are some groups of swordfish that mm. don't really have a sword appendage on their mm -hmm. nose but they attached um, prosthetic swords to the males of some species <laughs> and they found that the females preferentially mated with long sworded males even in species that typically didn't have a sword appendage that's very interesting yeah um so yeah so yeah that's and that, i think it's a pretty cool study because it's you know it's kind of theoretical to, to say something like the 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 peacocks have these tails and it must you know the females must pick them because they survive whereas the other males don't or whatever but here we can actually test this hypothesis you can directly test this idea so it's it's not just hypotheticals it's not just in the abstract this is we can actually show that this is most likely to be the case. All right. Next slide, please. Okay. Actually, we well, may. It, well, no, we've only got ten minutes left. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Dapper. Real quick, it, it, it is true that there is the swordfish, which is um, Ziphius gladius, and I was using swordfish as sort of a shorthand for Ziphidae broadly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew what you meant. I knew what you meant. And I'm sure the audience. Well, did. it came up in chat, so I want to point out that I was tech. Yeah, technically it was not correct for me to say swordfish. I should have said Zyphidae. I Also, I think we have 20 minutes because we started like 11 minutes late, I believe. So, I mean, if uh, you want to really go much genetic drift, I'm not sure. Let's do it. I think we only have one slide on anyways. Uh, because oh, it's only it's, one slide, then yeah, let's do it. I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of a difficult concept to get one's head around anyways, so I was like, I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty of it, just sort of the, the broad strokes. Okay, so we are no longer talking about selection. Okay, folks, we natural selection, we were predominantly concerned with beneficial and detrimental alleles. The detrimental alleles are more likely to be weeded out, and the beneficial alleles are more likely to increase in frequency within the population. Now we are talking about neutral uh, alleles, neutral changes, neutral mutations. Mm -hmm. And so these, because they are not subject to any sort of selective pressure, either natural or sexual selection, these can fluctuate at random within the population. Your parents may or may not have had some particular mutation, and it didn't affect their genotype or their phenotype at all, and it won't affect yours at all, and it probably won't affect your offspring at all. And so as a result, just as a result of mating and passing on certain combinations of alleles these will fluctuate at random throughout the uh throughout the population but they have the potential to be selected if you have some allele and we talked about this previously with regard to bacteria to mm -hmm. and the evolution of antibiotic resistance because all of the point mutations are already sampled in the population all of them but what that means is, should the environment change, some of those point mutations, which were previously neutral, are likely to be beneficial, and some are likely to be detrimental. And now those which are beneficial are being selected for, and those which are detrimental are being selected against. And maybe some mutations that were originally beneficial or harmful are now neutral. They no longer have any bearing on whether or not you survive. Yeah. Would you like to add anything? Um, well, so one thing I want to say is that um, this gets into uh, an important thing that's often misunderstood, which is neutral theory, which was really, uh, really kind of proposed, proposed and fleshed out 
by the researcher Moto Kimura, who you mm -hmm. might be able to guess is Japanese. Mm -hmm. Or, sorry, was Japanese, I believe. He's now deceased for quite a while. Um, Pro yeah, probably. He was doing work in like the late 60s, early 70s, so yeah. Yes. Although, speaking of Japan and scientists, uh, turns out that the Emperor of Japan is actually a well-respected scientist with many, many papers. So, there Neat. you go. Yeah. And, that's actually what he does with his time because he doesn't have to run anything. So, you know, he does science. Fair enough. I mean, yeah. why not? Yeah. Anyway, um, so Moto Kimura was interested in what was called neutral evolution, which was evolution that isn't selected for. And so he came up with a lot of the mathematical models that we now use to understand how genetic drift and neutral variation and things like that change over time. And it's really uh, cool because neutral variation gives you a sort of a clear look at ancestry because if you look at something that has some kind of selection or sexual constraint on it, then it might not mutate as much as you would expect, or mutations might be weeded. Well, no, it'll mutate as much as you expect, but mutations won't be fixed very often because it's under a higher amount of constraint. So for instance, um, if you look at say, I don't know, like hemoglobin between say the great apes, well, hemoglobin is a pretty important uh, protein. You can't really break it or it's a really bad time. So you're going to get a relatively low number of differences in there, not necessarily because of relation, but because of selection. Whereas if you look at, say, intergenic regions, which are usually just there as spacers, and what's actually in there doesn't matter much, you can actually see this consistent accumulation of mutation over time. And so <clears throat> one of the interesting predictions that you get from evolution, but that you would not get from any other explanation of biodiversity, is that neutral mutations should also form a strongly nested hierarchy, mm -hmm. even in cases where... Um, areas of the genome under selection might not give you as strong a signal. And that's, in fact, what we find, which is, it's yep. hard to explain that by any mechanism other than evolution. Yes, uh, to, shout, to shout out uh, Dan Stern Cardinal, he did a video a little while back, and I do not remember the name, so just go check out his channel in general. He makes very good videos uh, where he talked about that. He talked about specific predictions of separate versus common ancestry and so regions not and so yeah basically as dapper said so yeah it's, it's very uh, cool also moto kimura is often misused because in his mathematical models he excluded um beneficial mutations because they would tend to support yes. his numbers and he's been then falsely um claimed to have said that there just weren't any or there were so few that they basically didn't matter when in fact it was quite the opposite there were so so many and they were selected for so quickly and so strongly that he had to just pretend they didn't exist in order to get his math to work. Yep, and some people apparently cannot read and cannot seem to understand that fact. But whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I think some people deliberately don't understand that fact. That's probably true. That That is probably the case. Um, I guess the other thing which, which we could mention is that there was this whole debate kind of back in the 70s and 80s about it was called selectionism versus uh, neutralism. And it was a big misunderstanding. Um, the Kimura never, again, never proposed that, um, that, that selection didn't happen. Right. The issue was that selection would overpower, you know, the, the changes that are occurring neutrally. And so he had to exclude those from, as you said, from his calculations. But other people, scientists even, took that to mean selection just doesn't happen. Right. And there were people for and against that idea. They were like, oh, no, most evolutionary changes are just neutral, blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was just a complete misunderstanding of Kimura's work. And I'm really glad we are now past that debate because it was dumb. There was no point for it. <laughs> so, All right. Next slide, please. All right, I guess we'll we'll get into speciation here uh, in the next like for, or for well for the next ten minutes we'll just talk about it. So it speciation. So this is this is the process of one species becoming two. I know, crazy world. Um, and a species, well, in the the mayor species concept is a, a reproductively viable population, um, and that you know broadly work well in fact the first example here shows that it doesn't really quite work but yeah um so but 
it's it's an okay so, it's an okay thing as a beginning understanding of what a species yes. might be in many groups of organisms but when you get down to the nitty-gritty of actual biology and like no it it kind of falls apart there was a, a meme i saw on twitter that said um in elementary school doesn't know what a species is in high school knows what a species is in college doesn't know what a species is <laughs> <laughs> and I really appreciate that meme. Well, I mean, it's true. It's, it's also yeah. the case for like history, right? Like you go to elementary school and you're like, oh, okay, so this was the cause of this war. Then you get to high school and you're like, well, it's a little bit more complicated. And then you get to college and they're just like, you think that was the cause of the war? Hold on. <laughs> you have to go through these manuscripts by this dude before you can even begin to think about the causes of this war. <laughs> dude, I spent a fair bit of time in the um, Boston Public Library's Department of Rare Books and Manuscripts, looking up handwritten letters from the eighteen like sixties. Yeah, exactly. So it's a thing. Um, so speciation. So these examples. So we have one observed example and one. Uh, I mean, they're both observed. One natural example and one uh, artificially induced example. So the natural example is Procambarus virginalis, which is the <laughs> the unfortunate little crawfish on on his back or on her back. Sorry, because the one on top is a male Procambarus phallax attempting to mate with the virginalis and is not succeeding. It does not work. He might not They're, know that. He, he, he almost certainly doesn't know that. Or maybe he does. And he's just having a good time. Who knows? Regardless, um, Procambarus uh, phallax uh, or an individual had a gamete that experienced a whole genome duplication. And this occurred back in the 90s because researchers, going back to phylogeography, researchers can trace like where and when pretty much exactly this happened using the genetics of this, this species. And so this individual had offspring, but the offspring were triploids rather than diploids. That means instead of having two copies or two uh, sets of chromosomes to uh, two complements they had three sets of chromosomes but this also as a result made them asexual they reproduce asexually now ver basically by cloning themselves instead of sexually which is normal for crawfish and so this new uh this new species this asexual species uh got released into the environment at some point so pet owners don't release your species into the environment please because they're Sweet. invasive and they're taking over waterways in Europe now and out competing the native uh, crawfish because it's much easier to just clone yourself than find a partner to mate with. In the so, short term, yeah. Yeah, unless, you know, like some kind of parasite comes along, then they're probably screwed. But it, yeah, in the long term, Procambarus virginalis is probably not going to be the progenitor of like the next big thing in a uh, right. you know, crawfish. However, for the time being, it's actually a pretty big problem in a lot of areas of the world right exactly um so that is you know that's a that's a human time scale dapper was around in the 90s and also 90 million years ago so right i was gonna say i mean if you're gonna use me as the time scale then a lot of speciation is uh viable, <laughs> okay i was i think it was early 90s so i wasn't quite there yet it was just slightly before jackson um, but still, that's, you know, observable human timescales. I guarantee a fair bit of our audience was alive uh, and possibly Actually, you, missed out, you missed out on the height of flannel. I'm sorry. Darn shucks. Yeah. What a shame. And baggy pants. <laughs> Man. And no sleeve flannel baggy pants. The height of the 90s. <laughs> um, and the other one, this, and this will be it. We'll, we'll just, we'll um, close out after, after we explain this as well. Um, is this these guys are I, I realize i didn't put the name in there this is drosophila pseudo obscura that's the name of that fruit fly they're not really so, obscura they're just a little bit obscura <laughs> exactly um actually okay well fun thing i'll tell you about this paper in a moment so these researchers took um these this fruit fly the pseudo obscura and they reared it on different types of food one on a starch medium and one on a sucrose medium and they raised these guys for uh, a couple generations and after a few generations they tried to um have the fruit flies or these these fruit flies interbreed the different the starch and the sucrose populations and they did not interbreed they wanted nothing to do with each other 
And at the time, the researchers could not figure out how this was the case. It was way too short of a time scale for them to have like genetically diverged, right? Because um, I don't think it was that many generations. Uh, and it turns out, researchers figured out later, that it was a there was a gut bacterium. Because these populations are being raised on these different food sources, their gut bacteria are giving off different uh, metab metabolites as a result. And this is causing the fruit flies to basically only seek out other fruit flies who also have gut bacteria displaying these metabolites because they get incorporated into the fruit fly system and they're, you know, displaying it, so, you know, in some way outwardly. And so there's speciation, but due to a novel food source, right? You have genetic speciation in your, in the Procambaris example, and then sort of an ecological, morphological uh, speciation yeah. on, on the there's right. There's also behavioral. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, I wish I remember the species, but there's a group of uh, flies in the United States, and I believe they're actually oh, apple the, flies or the something. The apple flies. Yeah. And yeah. so the thing is, apples are not native to North America. They were brought by European colonists. And so the original population of these uh, flies didn't actually... So these flies parasitize um, fruit. They lay their eggs in fruit, and then the, the larvae eat the fruit. That's why if you've ever been like apple picking, sometimes there's a hole in there, and if you were to cut that apple open, you would find a a worm it's a grub it's a you know it's a maggot basically mm -hmm. for these apple flies but the ones that still feed on native plants they have a different uh timing for when they mate than the ones that feed typically on apples because apples have a different um time when they're uh basically when you should be laying your eggs on the, i think if they actually lay them on the flower that that becomes the apple i think you're right yeah um but because of this those two populations despite the fact that they're genetically almost identical don't interbreed anymore because they're breeding at different times. And so genetically they're, they're compatible. There's no particular reason to think they wouldn't find each other attractive as mates, but because they're not mating at the same time, they're on their way to just becoming completely distinct species. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think we are going to cut it at this point because we're getting pretty close to the two hour mark. So, uh, for the next one, I'm pretty sure the only things left are the remainder of our talk on speciation and then the evidence that evolution has been occurring in the past. I mean, aside from the evidence, the evidence we already presented, showed. Yeah, right. like the biogeographic <laughs> evidence, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Aside from that, we will discuss, you know, like uh, we'll discuss genetics and the fossils and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so there's that. All right. Uh, Dapper, what's going on on your channel? In the new um, let's see. So, not tomorrow, but Saturday, we have part three of the Giant North America, where um, myself and Vishanti are taking a look at the weird and um, fairly racist conspiracy theories consider concerning the idea that North America once was ruled by a race of superhuman giants, because it basically comes down to people don't think native americans could build impressive structures if yeah what was what's the meme um just because white people didn't do it doesn't mean it was aliens <laughs> right or or giants in this case right yeah um so yeah it's it basically just comes down to well pff, native americans couldn't build giant mounds out of dirt which like why that's never well explained they just couldn't trust me <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't put dirt on dirt. Trust right. me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it had yeah. to be giants with a double row of teeth. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, which actually reminds me, I heard the argument uh, not that long ago that uh, you could tell that uh, Og, a king in the Bible, was a giant because you know his bed was 13 feet long. And I was like, you know, I could think of some other reasons why he might have a giant bed as a Bronze Age king. Just Yeah. Maybe just a hypothetical. <laughs> a couple reasons, maybe. I don't know. Um, oh so gosh. that's Saturday. Um, Tuesday. Jackson, we're hanging out again on Tuesday. We are hanging out again. We're doing Jackson with Jackson. What is it? Seven or something? Six? Seven? It's It's been an, enough that my mental health has deteriorated in the meantime. <laughs> Well, that's because you don't bring enough alcohol, man. <laughs> Just make sure you don't remember it the next day, and then everything's fine. <laughs> I guess that's true. There's a reason I do it. Oh, speaking of, uh, 
Dan Stern Cardinal had Dr. Charles Jackson on today. He did. I have not watched that yet, but I definitely intend to. I have. It was a it was a good it was a fun conversation. Um it was a little on the infuriating side, and Dr. Charles Jackson interrupted far too much. But that's okay. Um so let's see. That was Tuesday the 22nd. Uh, Thursday the 24th uh, should be actually the first part of my two-part Kurt Wise series called Kurt Unwise, <laughs> um, in which he tells us that you're a coward if you think that uh, pronghorn are neither antelope nor deer. Which is, that's just something. That's a whole yeah. claim right there. Saying that they're their own thing and more closely related to giraffes than the, to deer or antelope is just cowardice, apparently. For some reason, <laughs> I, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. But yeah, that's the stance he decided to go with is like, yeah, taking seriously the idea that giraffoidia exists is cowardice. That's that's amazing. I love it. Bovidae or cervidae are the only kind of pecorin uh, uh, artiodactyls that exist. Get out of here, know. other <laughs> moscidae. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Moscidae does not exist. Not in my deer, by the way. Not in my phone. That's as far ahead as I really want to look right now because I don't. I have other things. Um, as you guys might know, if you like join my channel or Patreon, you have access to like eight videos that haven't come out yet. That's a lot. That's a lot of yeah. videos. I well, so I've been trying to get ahead because weeks like this week where I've had things like you know trips to hospitals and things like that have uh, that comes up sometimes, and I don't want to have to just fall behind simply because I had stuff to do. Those are substantially less fun. Uh, well, it wasn't too bad for me. I wasn't the one who was a patient, so. Okay. Well, I hope that. Wait, hold on. You went to a hospital, not a, a vet clinic. Then no. Well, vet... Right. The patient was a human. I was not the patient. Oh, I thought you said you. I thought you said I was the. Oh, sorry. I got no, 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 I was okay. not the patient. Oh, yeah. My bad. The patient okay. was human. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. Indeed, still not fun. But, um, well, thank you for coming on as always and thank you everyone in the audience for watching and thank you peter for hosting as always yo you're welcome Lord and savior can, can i also butt in a little bit about something that uh absolutely dapper mentioned earlier i want to apologize yes to the entire atheist community uh in general and to to both you and dapper specifically for the whole giant thing because um, when, when I started learning Photoshop, I joined this forum called, <laughs> called Worth 500. And um, what they would do to, to uh, uh, pretty much uh, 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 push people to do more in Photoshop, they would hold contests. One of the contests was um, uh, scientists unearthing a giant skeleton. The guy who won <laughs> made two pictures. One overall picture and then zooming in on that particular picture, which is the uh, uh, the archaeologist next to a giant skull, which is part of a giant skeleton. That is the number was... one picture used by young earth creationists who think that there were giants in the earth, as the Bible said. And you um, made it? No, no, no. A friend of mine made it. I wasn't. I okay. wasn't. I wasn't nearly as good as as any of the people who contributed back then. I just joined. I, I was but fully I, ready for you to be like, and I made it. No, 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 no. I can't take credit for something that I didn't make. I wish. I wish I had. I wish I would have contributed to that. Or could have contributed to that thing because. Uh, I think anywhere between 60 and 90% of the pictures used by Young Earth Creationists come from that particular thing, from that contest. At, that, that, that the is for, not the, surprising. The forum doesn't exist anymore, so there is, uh, it, it was bought up and then uh, parts of it were, were released. I'm not sure if, if the, the contest that I'm talking about is, is available still on the internet. Yeah, if you if you do a, a reverse search on those images, nine out of ten times you yeah. will see in the bottom worth five hundred. That means that it came from that contest. 
I am not at all surprised <laughs> that great. that has been the thing that has bamboozled yeah. the, cre- the creationists. Yep. To be fair. Next those, thing you know, they're yeah, going to be telling us not, that, uh, that Slender Man is one of the Nephilim. To, to be fair, those pictures were pretty convincing. Don't give them any ideas, Dapper. Oh, yeah. You know what? They don't need me for ideas. They come up with their own crazy ideas. I, I just was on Twitter, and, and I, I All right. by accident, oh. I clicked on it, so the sound may have been heard here as well. <laughs> Someone was no. Uh, I didn't hear anything. Some, some. No, you couldn't hear it, but maybe the people did. Oh. So someone was asking. I don't think I heard it either. Asking for me to make an intro, and then told me that uh, I had to film that because it wouldn't be convincing. And I made a moon landing, sent that to Buzz Aldrin. He thought it was convincing, so I, I tweeted that as well. So yeah, th- some things can be convincing. It's still not real. All right. Well, I gotta go before my internet drops off because it sounds like it's starting to rain outside. So. Okay, I'll take us out. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think my internet's gone. No, you're here. I still okay, hear you, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, Peter, play us out. Okay.